the invitation and everyone. Uh, I guess I need to. Okay. Uh, cancelar. Okay. I assume that you can hear me. There was like some questions there that I needed to click on. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's my first time at uh, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Although I somehow feel that, you know, I have been like interacting with several of you for so many years that I feel at home now, especially with Paco. I think that Paco and I met when I still had hair and black beard. Uh, or maybe, I don't know, maybe I didn't have a beard at that time. So yeah, I feel, I feel at home. And um, I tend, you know, I can be very formal if you want, but I tend to be a little bit more informal when I'm like at home. So if you're okay with that, uh, I'm gonna be uh, talking and, and maybe, you know, like going a little bit in detail in a, in a few slides and less in a few others, because I feel that uh, you guys uh, here at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and, and what we do at the IRI, the International Research Institute for Climate and Society, uh, which is now part of Columbia University Climate School, um, are very similar. So, yeah, I think so far so good, yeah, thank you. No one has complained at least, so. Um, so yeah, so it's a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna be talking about this uh, next gen met methodology. We used to have a different name, but you know, like we go with uh, what the people, what, what uh, our partners in, uh, around the world um, suggest. And uh, this has been a methodology actually originally implemented. It's like, if you can, if, if you want, it's like 28 years long, uh, old, which is the, I, the age of the IRI. And uh, has been originally implemented by, you know, Lisa Goddard, um, who was until very recently our uh, director at the IRI. Hopefully several of you know about her. Simon Mason, Andy Robertson, and many, many, many others. So what I'm gonna be doing today is to talk a little bit about this uh, context and societal applications. And again, when we give this type of talk to uh, other institutes and peoples, we need to emphasize that we are demand driven. But here at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, you know, I know, we know that we are on the same page and we follow the same approach. So apologies in advance, because a few of the slides that you might see here might be kind of obvious for some of you, and maybe um, a few others might not be that. So I, I needed to have, you know, I wanted to have like uh, a general a landscape for everyone. So then I'm gonna talk about the next gen approach per se, and I'm gonna be uh, you know, focusing a little bit on the seasonal time scale, but also talking a little bit about the subseasonal one. And I think the most important ones are a few of these concrete examples. And because it's a lot of information, Carmen Gonzalez and I are gonna, as, as Paco mentioned, I'm gonna be back in January talking about a few of these uh, uh, examples, like more in detail, uh, especially on climate and, and health uh, related uh, services. And then I hope that we can have a discussion and, and, and some you know, time for questions too. So I think that, as I said before, we are demand driven, same as you at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, the IRI, uh, the kind of things that we do, you know, state of the art research, but also a, a, a very important focus on, on application and services is very um, demand driven. So <clears throat> decision makers, require not only information on one particular time scale, and that's why we call this a cross time scale approach, but also tailored information. Very often we see that, uh, you know, around the world, these decision makers get information about, for example, total rainfall. But very often what we hear is that that is key, but should be um, also like complemented by frequency of rainy days and information about how the rainfall is gonna be distributed. And very often in order to do that, we need information at subseasonal time scales and seasonal time scales and interannual, decadal weather, because we believe that you know Mother Nature actually doesn't distinguish, doesn't discriminate between weather and climate. It's a continuum of time scales. So information about onset, the duration of the rainy season, or even in some cases uh, like the dry season, and in, in several places in Central America, North and South America, we have the midsummer drought. That information is important. Sometimes it's uh, very often actually is missing. And we want also to provide a flexible format approach. The old fashioned tertiary probabilities are very, very useful. And people, depending on the context, people understand those very well. But we think that, and we have seen that you use the same approach here at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, providing information for all thresholds, providing the entire probability density function 
is key. And the idea is that if we can have not only climate forecasts, which uh, in several cases are still like in the middle of what the decision makers actually need, if we can provide not only climate services, I was saying, but also uh, sorry, um, primary information, but also information on food security, like, I don't know, crop yield, or even information about the actual predictant, the variable that we want to forecast, the actual predictant that the decision makers need, that would be great. So next gen is so flexible that can be used, and I'm gonna be, you know, most of my talk is gonna be addressing those climate variables for obvious reasons, I think. But then I'm gonna be showing a few of these extra ones that are related to food security, uh, things like, you know, in January, Carmen is gonna be presenting um, a paper that we're about to submit on um, uh, a forecast system for acute undernutrition for kids under five, which is not a very common predictant, especially, you know, in, in what you can see out there, and especially for Central America. And I'm gonna be talking briefly today about this other uh, uh, next gen forecast system for human migration in Central America. And, uh, you know, there are several, several of these applications. So why don't we start and it's like, let me try to define next gen uh, in just one sentence saying that it's a systematic general approach for co-designing because you know we always work with the decision makers on the ground never we never start at home we always like go to the to the field and identify those demands as i mentioned before so it's always a co something co-designing co-implementing producing and very fine objective forecast at multiple time scales not only climate ones so it's designed by the user and offers tailored probabilistic and deterministic forecasts at multiple time scales. And a few of these examples for climate variables I just mentioned before, frequency of rainy or dry days, the onset demise and duration of the rainy season or seasons. And in some other cases, even again, like for uh, food security is very important to have what we call the rainfall characteristics of the midsummer drought, um, which tends to happen in August, probably you already know about that. Um, so beyond these uh, rainfall characteristics and temperature characteristics, having information on the particular predictants of interest is very important. So why, what, how, and where? Um, the name actually was a crazy one, and people in Colombia, the country, not the university, in Colombia, they started to call it La Siguiente Generación de Pronósticos. And we came back in one of those reports, uh, our head of uh, media, Francesco Fiondella, said, oh, well, you know, a cooler name rather than blah, blah, blah should be next gen, which is what they are actually calling it in Colombia. And that's why we started to call it next gen, although the system has been out there for several years. And actually, it's the product not only of IRI research, also our interactions with the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and other centers. But why next gen? Well, obviously, because there is a demand for that, going well beyond the traditional variables, going well beyond the traditional way we communicate, we present those forecasts. And as you probably know, in the WMO Executive Council, the 69th uh, session, uh, there was and several other documents. I'm not going to read all those uh, things in, in the slides. You can read that. Um, several sessions have been suggesting that there is a concrete need for transitioning, you know, like a lot of the call for the Climate Outlook Fora are still working on a subjective basis. And that there are a lot of pros and cons for, if we want to use subjective and ob objective uh, forecast system. That's you know, that's fine. But now we see a lot of advantages in actually like focusing on these objective systematic approaches. And WMO has been um, insisting on having that. And next year is actually you know like answering to that particular call. We have been doing this. Also, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center has been doing that along with the IRI for years now. And, and we have a concrete um, new document published last year, several um, folks around the world contributed to it, which is uh, the WMO uh, guidance document on objective uh, seasonal forecast. And you know, the seasonal one and hopefully other uh, timescales are gonna come at some point. So it's an important need out there. And also we obviously all want to take full advantage of this availability of the uh, global ensemble forecast systems that are being provided uh, for free in most cases <clears throat> and are, are need to be tailored and need to be regionalized. So how to do that? How can actually help the, the, the national med services 
which is at the core of our mission at the IRI, around the world, they, in, in general, they are like, there are not a lot of people working on this, uh, uh, in, the, in the production of, of, of climate forecast. So we need to be able to help them to produce this forecast in a routine automated uh, way. So as you probably are aware of, these national med services in general has been using for years and years and years observed sea surface temperature as uh, the uh, candidate predictor, the best predictor in some cases in order to forecast things like rainfall. And uh, next gen, and you know, it, it, it is amazing because this is you know year 2021, but even in 2018 when we started a big project at the IRI called Act Today, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about it later. People were still doing this, and I'm sure that people in national map services around the world are still using observed sea surface temperature from from the previous month or season as the only predictor to forecast rainfall even when we have amazing models around the world that we can use and that we can tailor and we can calibrate, et cetera, et cetera. So what people have been doing or were doing before next gen, you know, in our, at least our partners were using these SST patterns and combine those with station data or gridded data in order to produce this, uh, you know, um, probabilistic in general, but also could be deterministic forecast could be produced in the format that you are seeing there, especially these tercile probabilistic forecasts that are so common and that you know so well. And when we go out there, what we explain is that SSTs are not enough for many obvious physical reasons. And you know, we try to you know show a few of these things, saying you know consider even like too strong El Nino or too strong La Nina, and even when the sea surface temperature patterns might look similar, they are not exactly the same. The atmospheric circulation patterns are not exactly the same. So we need really to take full advantage of the information that are being provided by this um, uh, couple or non-couple, in some cases, uh, climate models, and, and to be able to see you know, how we can, which models work best for my region and for my predictant, and, and how to actually calibrate them and produce the best ensemble that we can. So, not only that, the calibration is obviously very important. And of course, um, you know, you guys at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center have been doing this for years too, but providing this um, flexible format of forecast, that means like the entire PDF. Of course, we are not going to, pro to provide the PDF directly to the decision maker. They tend to understand better things like the probability of exceedance, you know, so, you know, we build that from the PDF. But PDF is still too abstract for, for the general, um, I'm gonna say decision maker we interact with. So, you know, there is a lot in terms of the, the, the producing the climate service in terms of not only the generation, which might be, you know, the main thing I'm discussing here today, but also the translation transfer and use. That's how IRI um, defines climate services. We know that there are several definitions. So generation, transfer, uh, translation and use is key. And just so you know, additional information regarding next gen, we start with the demand. So we identify what are the predictants that are needed at that and that like in, a, um, in several sessions with the local experts, national map services, but the decision makers in the food security and agriculture um, realm, if you want, or, or the health one, we sit together to uh, co-identify what are the um, best predictors and that can provide obviously like predictability or forecast skill uh, at multiple time scales. And this is very, very important because again, sometimes we see that people, if they want to do a seasonal forecast, they only use seasonal predictors like ENSO, like El Nino Southern Oscillation, for example. And we know that we can get, we can pump predictability from multiple time scales to target the particular time scale of interest. And then of course we take full advantage of you know, the knowledge that they have, if indeed the observed sea surface temperature should be considered, why not? Just keep it. We can have a multiple predictor um, uh, system. Why not? But we, we combine NMME, the North American Multimodal Ensemble models with C3S with a wide variety. There are, we all know, like multiple uh, sources of uh, model output out there. 
that can be combi combined if we know what we're doing and how to do it. Because of course, you know, we need to pay attention to the length of the training period, the hindcast, the number of years in our hindcast for the NMME is not, uh, it's not the same one as in C3S. So there are a lot of things that we need to pay attention to. I'm not going to bore you with the details. We co-identify what are the best models. We calibrate the best models using a wide variety of metrics. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. And then we also have uh, a variety of approaches to do the ensemble, uh, to compute the ensemble. And then we produce, you know, like typically using the data library, we produce this set of maps. So just to summarize, we take full advantage of multiple predictors, not only because we know about this uh, wide variety of, of, of model biases, um, we not only use model rainfall, we pay attention to, for example, um, um, moisture advection, we, we not only observe sea surface temperature, but forecast sea surface temperature. In some cases, like especially in Central America, the midsummer drought that I was mentioning before, is um, uh, related to the effects of the Caribbean low level jet. So we need to consider the zonal component of these winds at 925 millibars. So depending on the case we identify, right now I'm talking about climate variables, but you will see later that next gen can also include non-climate um, predictors. So once we combine that with the observations, we always guarantee to have a model output statistics approach called it calibration. I know that you know, some people call it bias correction, and that's different than calibration or recalibration. Uh, for, you know, in order to simplify our life, I'm going to call that uh, calibration, and we produce our different types of maps. I'm going to be discussing that later. So we are very interested in correcting uh, not only the mean bias, but a wide variety of biases, even for the uh, PDF, for the probability density function. And most often than not, we tend to use a pattern-based calibration approach. So again, it's demand-driven. It depends on what we want to do. But very often, rather than do, going with a local or grid box by grid box, if you want more like a statistical approach, we try to understand what is wrong in the model. So here you can see um, um, kind of PNA like pattern, or you know, even let's say in general, this looks like a meridionally propagating Rossby way. This is how you see it in the reanalysis. And this is an old model, but you know, um, several others are doing like this um, uh, weird things when you see a displacement in the pattern. So if this is a systematic error, we can identify it and we can correct it. Every time the model is saying something like this, we will do something like that. And in such a way that is a process-based pattern calibration approach that will automatically translate into correcting uh, different kinds of biases, not only the mean or the amplitude biases. And we pay a lot of attention to these things. And we have several methods to do that. Some are EOF based, like empirical orthogonal function based, but we can also do things with weather typing. And I'm not going to bore you with the details. So it's very important for us, for the decision makers to always have calibrated forecasts and we do local and non-local ones. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, uh, but we tend to do more often. We, we have shown that, especially for the seasonal case, the seasonal time scales, the pattern-based calibration one tends to be, tends to provide uh, better results than when we do the local one that has like several issues. For example, even in terms of homogeneity of, of, um, of, of the results, you know, sometimes because you are the only focuses on that grid box, the next grid box might not, even because of noise, error sampling might not be producing a consistent uh, forecast. It might say actually that is normal when you actually are expecting from a physical point of view that is above normal or below normal. So we pay a lot of attention to this pattern-based calibration. And of course there are pros and cons. There are a wide variety of these uh, methods. Um, we actually use uh, one of those that uh, Paco, I think was in one of his uh, papers in 2005, you know, we, we still have that in our toolkits, but we tend to go with this pattern-based uh, calibration ones. Um, you know, very often people, because they have been using our um, climate predictability tool or CPT, I don't know how familiar you are with it. Um, they are so familiar with uh, this tool that they tend to use just principal component regression and canonical correlation analysis. But again, we have several other options there. And again, there are different ways to do this ensembling. Uh, and, uh, and producing the PDF. 
I assume that, you know, we don't want to go into details, especially because of time, but we don't only do the ensemble in the deterministic space, the traditional way. Once we know, imagine um, for, for the sake of simplification, imagine that we're dealing with a Gaussian. So we also compute, we also do the ensemble in the Gaussian space. We ensemble the two parameters that we need in the Gaussian. So, you know, the variance, and then we obtain the standard deviation, and we also take the average, or, you know, it depends actually, you know, we're doing the median, which for the Gaussian doesn't, you know, is the same, but we do the ensemble on those two parameters, the average and the, and the spread. So we call that ensemble in the, in, the space, in the probabilistic space. And this is a typical schedule, you know, sometimes people say, okay, how much this will take? And, and uh, in some countries like Guatemala, this was actually eight, seven, eight months. It depends on, you know, how do you find the, define the start and the end? But uh, let's say that in one year, we have been able to implement this in several countries. And right now, you know, we, we because of this big project, we have been doing it uh, in uh, not only Latin America, we started in Colombia and Guatemala, but now we have it in Senegal, Ethiopia, Vietnam, Vietnam, and now actually all Central American countries have a seasonal next-gen system for uh, uh, rainfall. But we have several other locations, you know, this is actually short, uh, in Rwanda, for sure, when, when we see that has been working for more than a year and a half, it comes here to this list that we have. Uh, and also when we have it like for seasonal and subseasonal time scales already working, so then we, we report it like to the public. But a lot of things are going on there under the water and, and I'm not like even showing it here. So you have map rooms. If you're familiar with the data library, the IRI data library, we have map rooms that are like showing for the different models and for the next year's, the next gen system, the actual uh, uh, predicted capacity uh, using a wide variety of metrics. Um, obviously, you know the ones uh, that W recommends are already there, and we have you know products at different resolutions. You can see a low resolution one, which is the CPC unified data set, uh, but we can go really like high re resolution, like with chirps or even using our own IRI developed, co-developed Inax data, which is a way to merge um, local station data and satellite information. And also if you want like, you know, reanalysis or it depends. And we provide more information about, you know, what might we expect if we have time, I can show you this live, but this is the probability of exceedance, for example, for the 80th percentile the user can also choose the actual value in millimeters or Celsius or, you know, depending on the predict time that we are discussing. And we also provide for particular locations that the user can click and it will find the, the empirical PDF in black. Then the blue one is a smoothing that we do. So let's say that this is a climatology, both the blue and the black one for context or comparison. And then we have also the uh, forecast PDF. And you can see that it's very sharp. We pay a lot of attention to certain particular skill metrics. We cannot calibrate and optimize everything in general. You know? So we try to focus a lot on reliability and sharpness uh, because we, we, we have seen that it's very uh, important for the, for the user. So, you know, we have different methods at the IRI. This is our global forecast using extended logistic regression as the method for calibration. And you can see some key differences when, once we regionalize with this system co-developed on, in this case, by the Guatemala National Map Service uh, in Sivume. Uh, and they are using canonical correlation analysis here. And you can see, you know, like the actual PDF um, differ. And we tend to, because we obviously are building a system with them that is regional and using their local um, experience and local predictors, we tend to get like obviously like higher skill when we focus on that particular region. That's the, the particular case of Guatemala and Colombia, uh, for example. So for other time scales, we use exactly the same approach. We take full advantage of the fact that um, our partners have experience with CPT and with uh, the climate predictability tools that I mentioned before and all these uh, concepts to once they have that one implemented, we go to the next uh, time scale. And these days very often it's a subseasonal time scale, but there is a lot of interest, especially when you talk to, you know, the energy sector, or, um, you know, so well, we, we also, as uh, you probably know, we pay a lot of attention to uh, financial tools to transfer risk. And a lot of these guys, um, you know, insurance and, uh, 
companies, they are really interested in uh, interannual to decadal time scale. So the same approach can be used there. And uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this bridging and the bridging approach that we use, but I think that because of time, we will need to do that later. So we use, we have been uh, developing since 2018, this uh, Pi CPT, the Python wrapper for CPT. And it not only works with CPT, now we take full advantage of, of you know, all the different libraries that we have in Python to be able to mass product. If we want mass production, we go with Pi CPT. When we are like diagnosing, understanding and building the system, it helps to do the traditional, to work with the traditional CPT tool. But it, this is helping a lot, especially with the subseasonal time scale. And it provides, uh, we call this uh, diagnostic atlases with a wide variety of metrics. You know, here you have RPSS, but we have information-based metrics like ignorance. We have, you know, the entire decomposition of these metrics in terms of, you know, resolution, reliability, and uncertainty. And we can assess, we can provide all these different tools in an automated, like fast way. So people can focus on the things that we might be able to focus, which is analyzing and thinking rather than clicking, clicking, clicking and, and computing, especially when, you know, this is another, we're, we don't work with research centers when we are dealing with the climate services development. We work with, uh, in general, poor national med services that don't have a lot of people or experience on calculation or how to code in Python. So we pay a lot of attention to that. And I think I'm doing great in terms of time. I'm gonna be showing you right now, just a few examples of the things that we have been doing. And uh, we still don't have a clear name for these uh, applications. Definitely, you know, our climate services oriented, but these are not uh, next gen climate forecasts only. So there are several papers coming out of uh, the furnace, the oven uh, in the last uh, couple of years that are, uh, you can see here, and a few others are being prepared. So again, we're gonna be presenting, Carmen is gonna be presenting in January, a few uh, other things that are not listed here, there for obvious reasons, but uh, that we consider super important. We're paying a lot of attention to this. So last year we published in scientific report, this aedes born diseases next gen system. It's a next gen system that is also a monitoring and forecasting system for environmental suitability uh, of um, you know diseases like dengue, uh, uh, Zika, chikungunya, and um, we are very excited about you know potential collaborations with you guys here, especially you know uh, with um, racial law. We have been discussing this collaboration for a while, so looking forward to this. Then Carmen and Lisa got led this work on climate uh, services ecosystems. So it's not the same as uh, climate services for ecosystems. It's an ecosystem of climate services, and that's the IRI approach. And we explained that in the um, December 2020 WMO bulletin, especially in the in the context of food security and COVID. Um, and I think that that's also an interesting idea where NextGen has been playing an important uh, role. And you will see again uh, in January, this um, NextGen system for acute undernutrition for kids under five. Actually forecasting and the reliability and the ROC curves are amazing for this particular predictor, uh, predictant, sorry. Um, forecasting the number of cases of kids under five in Guatemala uh, for the different departments. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. This has been a part of this, that season has been already accepted in BAMS. Uh, this is the White at All 2021. Ponce at All discusses a coffee yield next gen system for Guatemala too. Ocean uh, forecast system using next gen has been recently presented at this EOO's um, note. And then, you know, the NMME and the next gen, uh, like um, liaison or link is, uh, is uh, about to be published in this Becker at all 2021. Anyway, so there are several of these examples. We work with this uh, agroclimatic round tables. We call those in Spanish Mesas Tecnicas Agroclimaticas or MTAs. And this has been uh, calling a lot of attention, not only the WMO attention, but we are now like developing this around the world. And it's a nice place where we have a two-way uh, interaction between the decision makers and the local and sometimes international um, experts on how to co-identify these demands and actually um, what we can do in order to satisfy that demand. As I mentioned before, IRI work pays a lot of attention to context. What has been happening in the past? 
understanding the past for us makes sense in order to make forecasts. We cannot provide forecasts without context. So that's why you know, we, we have that approach in X for the past and the present to um, monitor the present, understand the past, and then next gen to forecast at multiple time scales. But then we know, we know, we know that it's not about monitoring and forecasting. Even if our forecast is perfect, vulnerability and you know, risk depends on so many different things. So we have a wide variety of financial tools that we offer and co-develop with, with our partners. Things like index-based insurance, things like, and you, you see here an example for Malawi. We also have this one for Guatemala and Colombia now, like several other places. Um, we, we, we have this forecast-based um, financial mechanism. If we know that we expect because of an El Nino or because of the MJ, because of a combination of driver, whatever that is, we know that we're gonna have a drought. And we know that the government can send the money in advance and is sitting, waiting for that to happen or not. But we're, we're advancing and, and, and saving a lot of precious time because the money is already sitting in the region, in the local government or the local NGO or whoever that is, but it's already there. And then once it happens, because we have those triggers, then we can send the money directly to the people. If we have this set of financial instruments in place well in advance, our ecosystem of services can and are helping uh, decision makers and society to be more resilient. That's you know, part of what we want. I mentioned before that uh, with Diego Pons, we just published this next gen system for uh, coffee yield. We have been working also with FAO and WFP on a wide variety of additional next gen system, really targeting these like crops or agriculture services or food security services. And this is something that uh, I already mentioned and we're gonna be discussing in January. This is, uh, you see a uh, GROC, the generalized rock metric on the left for this acute undernutrition next gen system. <clears throat> and, um, and, you know, it's like we actually tend to be better where we need it in the, in the dry corridor in Guatemala, and hopefully we can um, generalize this uh, forecast system for um, other locations that actually need it urgently in Central America. But this is an example of a forecast uh, for acute undernutrition for Central America. And you know we obviously have all the uh, formal metrics, reliability, ROC, GROC, anyway. And this has been calling a lot of attention I don't know if we should call this actual forecast. Maybe these are projections, but definitely not climate change projections. We have been paying a lot of attention because uh, I'm gonna just say that the United States government um, uh, requested uh, IRI to have forecasts for um, migrations coming from uh, what we call the Northern Triangle, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras in Central America to the Southern very specific predicted southern border of the US. And they provided monthly data since 1999 of all the apprehensions they have in the southern border. So this is actually not forecasting migration. This is forecasting number of apprehensions by the police, by the border control patrol uh, in the southern border of people coming from Guatemala, El Salvador, or Honduras. So it's a very a specific predict 10 and we needed to understand very well what's what was going on and we're still doing that because now COVID is in the mix and it's a very complicated mix and what we found there because everyone is talking about climate migrations and for sure climate impacts migration especially sea level rise related to climate change in you know small island nations you know sea level rise is going to make people migrate yes sure you know I don't think that we need to discuss that but a lot of people just say that because of uh, global warming, for each 100, sorry, for each uh, uh, Celsius, uh, one Celsius increase, we're going to have 2.3 million people migrating from point A to point B. And the only predictor in their models is global temperature for a place like Guatemala. So that makes my hair fall. And that's why we pay a lot of attention to what's going on and what is the context. And we, have been able to identify, and you can see that like summarized here. I don't know if we have time to you know, talk in detail about all these things, but we have a lot of uh, predictors, candidate predictors 
And actually we have been able to quantify, to weight how important climate versus non-climate factors are. And to be able to do the same as we do with climate, this next gen multi-model, multi-migration model ensemble, which is your red line is the, is the median. And then you have the uncertainty envelope and I don't know how you want to call it, like light red, and how that compares to the actual number of app apprehensions in the uh, southern border. These are our standard deviations. So, you know, we can transform that in actual number of cases. We want to hide that right now for reasons that I don't want to bore you with, but this is the kind of things that we can actually do. And same as usual, sometimes the models are not that perfect. And especially after, you know, COVID, we are updating our model to be able to capture that impact. So I think that's what I have. Uh, we said something like 40 minutes, isn't it, uh, Paco? So sorry, it took 42. So we can have some time for discussion and questions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Angel. That was very interesting. I, I, yeah, very much along the lines of what I, I was uh, expecting. Um, we, we have a question already in the chat, but I, I, I wanted to encourage everyone to either write <clears throat> your question uh, on the, in the chat or to raise your hand in the list of participants in, in Zoom. Um, so maybe Bala, you, you want to take the floor and, uh, and formulate your question to, to Angel. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah. Perfect. Uh, very nice talk. And uh, um, I just uh, had a, uh, want to, uh, you to elaborate a bit on the effort which had been taken to use such a next gen methodology for annual or multi decadal time scale. If uh, I just want to know if there was any attempt made to use this methodology in such time scale. And yeah. oh, please, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, this is this was my first question. Following that, I would also like to know if the users that you are in contact with or IRS IRA is in contact with are uh, interested in such long-term time scales. Yeah, so, absolutely. I'm gonna start with your first one, if you are okay with it. And I think I have it in front of me and on the screen. So um, yeah, so this is the thing, like, because we're demand driven, our partners in general focus a lot on seasonal time scales. And once they realize that um, it's not enough, we, you know, I think that they knew that from the very beginning, but they were like, oh no, we want to do this and one step at a time. Once they have that, so the next, typically what they ask next is the seasonal one. We work a lot with health and at the agriculture communities. Um, we are working now with the energy and the insurance uh, sector, if you want to call it like that. Um, and they tend to be more interested in the interannual to what I think you call the longer term, you know, more like interannual to uh, decadal. By the way, for us, interannual basically ends in five years or something like that. I know that uh, depending on which, who we talk to, uh, that is the multi-decadal or decadal one. So I, uh, when I talk about multi-decadal, in this case, it are multiple decades and also um, uh, climate change. So the IRR approach, as I mentioned before, is, is um, across time scales. We uh, are going to start like uh, producing this. Um, you're going to be able to see very soon these map rooms showing the background signal, the climate change background si signal, if you want the very long-term one, and then the multi-decadal one the interannual one and the um, and the um, uh, you know seasonal and subseasonal and we don't do weather but we encourage people to consider all these different time scales. So not a lot of publications right now on next gen systems for interannual to multi decadal. You are going to see those uh, in the coming years. So what we have been doing a lot is to get everything ready for also those decision makers or you know experts partners, I'm going, to call, I'm going to say partners right now, to be able to use the same set of tools. For historical reasons, we developed CPT at seasonal timescales first, and then we realized that we could use modifying a few things, the same approach for subseasonal. And what we call Pi CPT right now has two versions, one for seasonal and subseasonal. We're in version 1.9. We're about to launch version 2. Version 2 will be able to deal with all different timescales because we have uh, now, like, been learning how to have, like, have more, if you want, flexible, but more monolithic approach or, or set of tools. So I ho hopefully I have answered actually now 
both of your questions, especially regarding the users uh, for subseasonal and seasonal uh, agriculture, food security, uh, health, disaster risk, risk management. Probably you know that we work a lot with the Red Cross, Red Crescent um, Climate Ch uh, Change Center. Um, but yes, like a lot, a lot of our work has to do with local, national, with sorry, national um, meteorological uh, and hydrological services. So hydrology is a lot of those other um, decision makers that we uh, pay attention to, but also a lot with the ministries of environment. And maybe for obvious reasons, I'm from Venezuela, as Paco told you, um, we have been doing a lot of this in Latin America, in Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. So I can talk to you perhaps a lot more about concrete cases there and users there than in some other places around the world, but happy to follow up on that. Sorry if that was a long answer. I don't know if I answer both your questions. Yeah, uh, thanks for the clarification. Okay, thanks. Uh, any any more questions? Isa? Yeah, I would like to know if uh, in all the stakeholder engagement that you do, you say that you can work at different scales. Uh, have you found the stakeholders that are really willing to get the information from weather up to multi, multi interannual, for example, or it's always different people in the same institution looking for different time scales? So I'm, I'm going to say, thank you. Very, very important question, Isadora. So I'm going to say that um, depending on the sector and within a sector, depending on the actual set of users, the answer is different. But I'm going to try now to generalize and say, for example, in agriculture and food security, they pay a lot of attention, as I said before, uh, to seasonal and subseasonal, but they want to have information also about what might happen next year. That comes very often. And I know you at BSC and are, are doing uh, that too. Like, it's like what, how it's gonna be like next year. And sometimes the way we present the information for next year, obviously, you know, you can use the same kind of approach and methods, but it's not the same um, averaging or window, you know, like the average window is different for different time scales. And that's part of what actually I would like to discuss with you guys during my visit here at the IRI in terms of, you know, these new ideas that we have on how to have the bridging at multiple timescales and identify those um, averaging windows, if you want to call it like that, or windows of opportunity. But coming back to your question, because we have a, this um, climate services ecosystem, we offer to, coming back to agriculture and food security, we offer this set of financial um, tools to transfer risk. And that involves, for example, insurance. And the insurance companies, for sure, they want interannual to longer time scales. I don't know if really multi-decadal, but well into you know, what might happen in the, I don't know, 10 years from now or something like that, not really 40 years or so. But a lot of people out there, probably you have seen it, are still like very focused on what uh, climate change is gonna do. And although in general, our approach at the IRI is that is very important, but we need to get adaptation measures and strategies to what might happen in 2100, one day, one week, one month, one season, one year at a time. So that's why we, our approach is this climate services ecosystem that considers all the different time scales, but that focuses on this, actually this big project I just mentioned is called Act today, adapting agriculture to climate today for tomorrow, one bit at a time. So again, you might say the farmer is not actually asking you what might happen in the next 10 years. That's true, some actually do. But in general, is the insurance, is the, if you want the satellite services related to this, in this particular case, the agricultural climate services, those who are asking for those longer time scales. And, and as IRI, we need to pay attention to the entire landscape. We pay a lot of attention to the connections, to the links between the different, if you want, actors or institutions. So, so you know, we believe in this ecosystem uh, approach that I have been discussing. I don't know if that answers the question, Salora. Yes, thank you. Okay, any other questions? 
Oh yeah, we have two here in the room. Okay, yeah, I was expecting. So I, I, I don't know if we can hear uh, Dragana or the others, but uh, maybe you can repeat the question, uh, Angel, if, uh, okay. if you formulate the question. You can also come and they can see you. Yeah. Oh, they know you, okay. okay. Thank you very much. It was very interesting and I can't wait to be uh, material about many aspects of the work, but I will uh, uh, relate to one of the last things that you mentioned, which was about this financial tool for, for transfer yeah and maybe you mentioned malawi or i was just curious if it's already in practice in some of the countries and and how do you work with the delegating participants in this transfer is it with the government or are the private insurance companies if you can just elaborate a bit on how does it work in practice absolutely i think that uh, sorry, I'm going to repeat the question. Like, I'm going to actually summarize this uh, to elaborate on the financial instruments um, and as a set of transfer tools, if you want to call it like that, um, you know, tools to transfer risk. Um, and uh, you mentioned also like this the example in, in Malawi, and we have a very uh, recent one for um, Guatemala. And I, I wish, you know, um, I could like give you. I could show you something live from my computer, but you know we, we are we're not there and it's password protected, whatever. So in order to, to take full advantage of time, this is how I'm gonna summarize it. Yes, depending on the on the location on the on the country, you will have the um, the government involved. Governments, for example, in Guatemala in Central America are these days very, very interested in having this set of tools. And uh, you know, they are complementary tools. So people tend to think that if I do a forecast-based uh, financing you know, system uh, and I don't need the index-based um, insurance and, and they complement each other. So depending on where and what we're doing, you will have a private company taking care of the insurance. And in some cases it's supervised by the government. In some other cases, WFP, the world, you know, um, WFP or FAO, I'm not even going to mention more names, are also like involved because they want to supervise that, that things are working or not. And sometimes they don't work, okay? Because um, I'm not going to mention uh, particular cases, but sometimes we see some other interests involved. So having um, a bigger brother entity, the government, a government that doesn't have a lot of corruption, paying attention to these things are very important. And because we work in a lot of these developing countries where corruption, all this has been recorded, isn't it? Corruption is a thing. Um, sometimes things get far more complicated than the actual generation of the system and the tools. It's always, I think you will agree, a lot more about um, the, the network of institutions really willing to make that work. So Malawi has been out there for a while and we have several publications like, you know, like papers on it but also like case studies and white papers. And that has been one of our oldest ones and I can pro provide those. And maybe I think we're gonna have a meeting later today. So I can show you live on my computer, like the Guatemala one, which is, is I think that these are, and I love when I see, you know, people from uh, BSC like presenting because we are using the same approach. These things can be built if you have a, a PDF forecast, a flexible forecast, if you can produce if you can provide the forecast in terms of probability of exceedance or your PDF, so then you are ready to go into these things because it's not, it's not going to be enough that below normal or above categories. You need to have precise, very precise and flexible because different users will want different things, triggers for your concrete actions for your resilience. And that's why you need this approach. And not a lot of people, not a lot of institutes are doing this. I basically, you know, usually what I hear from people is like, oh, the Barcelona Super Community Center and IRI are this guy. If you have that, you're ready to go into this other realm. realm. I'm very happy to talk a lot more about it. Sorry, Paco, I have been like giving really long answers. It's because I'm happy and excited. I feel at home. <laughs> okay, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it, w it won't be the, the last time you, you'll be talking to Dragana and others uh, about this topic. Uh, was there another question there in the room? Actually, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, if you can come, then they can hear you. And I... <laughs> yeah. okay, no, well, related to what you just mentioned about this, uh, the three categories uh, classification being a bit obsolete and the need to either show a full probability distribution 
or at the probability of exceedance. So for these triggers or for these thresholds, do you have um, a way to determine them with the users depending on their type of decisions Perfect. or how, how do you do, have you developed this, uh, this procedure to select these three? Uh, Ab absolutely. So uh, Paco, everyone heard that, that question? Should I summarize it? Or? Uh, uh, the sound was very good. So you, you can okay. go ahead with the answer. Very good. So I'm going to actually show Malawi here. So your question is very important, and this is at the core of what we do. It's like it's demand driven. We do not, um, we help, but we do not define the triggers. The triggers are always and can only be defined by the local experts, especially if you're talking about insurance or, you know, like forecast based uh, action, not necessarily financing, but action that is widely used by our partners in uh, the Red Cross, Red Crescent Center. But these triggers need to be identified with the user. There is no other way. And sometimes you will need to be a little bit, um, in a good sense, creative, because you need, same as you know, with other sections of our work, you need, uh, you need multiple cases to be able to trust your triggers. You cannot do that with the last three years or five years. You need a lot of those. So sometimes you need to help them remember. And they will not tell you, Oh, it's the percentile 42, 42nd. They won't say that. You need to get there, but they don't even need to understand percentiles. So we have this set of tools that you can see on the screen that will have like the information from the user. This is an oversimplification because it says bad, good. You can see bad and some colors there, okay? So, so what is good or bad? We have a lot more information about why it was bad or why it was good or why there is no information there because it could be bad for different reasons, a hurricane, or a drought, and those are bad years for a farmer, okay? So you need to identify that, and then you need to translate, and that is part of your job, and that's where you need a PDF and maybe more than one threshold. There are very complex systems where you use multiple percentiles to define your trigger. And, and I have some slides that I might show like in our meetings later uh, today on how we do this, for example, in Central America with WFP for floods or fast, uh, fast floods. And it's beautiful because you can see how with two parameters, you know, again, it becomes like how many parameters, how many percentiles should I use in the definition of my system? And too many is redundant, too little, you might be missing things. But short answer, this is a very hot topic of research and development. And people are demand, there's a huge demand for these kind of products that involve every other thing I have been mentioning, next gen and in X, you know, monitoring, but especially paying attention to the demands, to the user. So I'm looking forward to talk a lot more about it and, and show you this live, you know, not, not a frozen screen, but you, you can see kind of the triggers up here. You can use sliders to identify, you know, what is the best configuration given what they are saying. They will never see the percentiles. Okay, thank you. So very interesting questions from the room as well. We have another one on, in chat by Nube. Uh, Nube, do you want to uh, formulate the question directly to Angel? Yes, hi Angel. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. Yes, I would like to ask you if you can further explain what you are doing in terms of um, seamless information, because I have seen that you provide uh, climate information at different time scale from sub-seasonal till um, uh, decades. But I'm wondering what you are doing in terms of um, maybe combining different uh, inform prediction for this at, at different time scale, or also if you are doing some kind of selection, for instance, of decadal prediction taking into account seasonal prediction or projection taking into account decadal prediction. So I'm wondering if you are doing a kind of this type of strategies. Yeah. So um, again, I, I will show this afternoon a few concrete examples, but this is the thing, short answer, especially because I think that we're running out of time. Short answer is right now, it's a lot about having in one place the different products uh, so people can see the seasonal signal, the seasonal you know, um, rainfall uh, forecast and the subseasonal one, they will have the weather one. And we have, I don't know if you guys know about our um, 
time scaled composition set of tools. We have some publicly available, uh, especially for temperature and, and rainfall are out there already, like tools that decompose this, the total variance in the long-term climate change signal and the decadal one, and then the shorter time scale. So we provide context on not only what is the forecast for those particular, those different time scales, um, but also what is the context? How important is for temperature um, uh, climate change or, you know, like the climate change signal or how important that is or not for rainfall. So they know not only uh, about the forecast but contextual information, but the truth is that we are not yet uh, provided. We don't have an operational forecasting system that can do automatically the bridging between all these time scales. We just submitted a proposal uh, to do that. And that's part of why, you know, that's part of our IRI mission here at, 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 at BSE to explore uh, collaborations with you guys regarding this very hot topic of research. So short answer, right now we present the different products and there is a lot of translation and training in terms of, you can see that there are some similarities in the in the subseasonal rainfall map when you compare it to the seasonal one. I actually have a few of those slides in a different presentation that I will be showing to you guys this afternoon. So there is a lot of, um, be careful here because models are not, although the model might be the same, they, the, the way the configuration is different and you might be like seeing things that are mismatching. So it's important to pay attention to that. If our information base you know, um, approach for doing this bridging works, I think that that, um, that might help to have like this operational system that can bridge between the different other, other um, system, forecast system and multiple time scales. This is a frontier question, Nube. This is a very hot and, you know, like, that's exactly what we're doing right now. And we were just discussing a few of these things with Paco, so thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, that's uh, that's actually one of the things that I'm sure we'll be talking about uh, uh, today, tomorrow, and also in January because we uh, we are uh, preparing some proposals along those lines, and uh, Nube and others will be quite interested in uh, discussing this with you. I see that Marcus was also online, that uh, will be uh, also quite um, interested in uh, in having a chat with you about this. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, one question from my side, but um, I, I would like to still offer the opportunity for to anyone else who wants to formulate other questions. Anything else? I don't see any hands, nothing in the chat. So uh, the, my, my question is, it's probably a, a, a bit trivial. You've mentioned several times uh, climate change in your talk uh, while you, you were talking about climate predictions. Um, and my what, what I wonder is how do you deal uh, when uh, interacting with the users um, about uh, their previous knowledge about climate change, their prejudices, and uh, how the climate information from climate forecasts can be inserted in a discussion uh, that can be biased by their uh, uh, knowledge and uh, and uh, understanding of uh, what climate change is. Yeah, absolutely, Paco. That's a that's a hard one in the sense that we see that very often, especially when we talk to when we are in projects with the World Bank and you know like these other institutes that have like these mandates to really pay a lot of attention to climate change. And they are, have already set the stage in terms of climate change, and people are already talking about, um, you know, this um, this particular configuration. Uh, things might take more time than 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 expected, in the sense that we cannot just come and say you're wrong. This is not about climate change. Is there is a lot of um, I don't know, like. Um, baby steps work in terms of them realizing by themselves, given the evidence, indeed we help providing some of that evidence, but we have learned that you cannot force those conclusions. They need to understand by themselves how important is climate change versus, I'm gonna call that uh, natural climate variability timescales and how that interaction um, actually produces what they see. And that if we pay only attention, that is key. When we start like discussing these topics with them, is that we got to the to the right um, place. That if it's climate change, they feel that that's something that they are going to solve 
at the cops. And this comes very often. Oh yeah, if it's climate change, as a farmer, I do nothing because that's the president's fault or you know, the United States or whoever it is who is doing or not doing the things. Um, but when we discuss um, with them the importance of this like continuous gradual adaptation rather than the I don't know, sudden one with the climate change, like paying attention to what might happen in the 2100, when they understand that everything is a continuous, so then you know, we feel that um, we're ready to go to actually this uh, additional discussion which can involve very technical issues. I think that you are also asking about those. Our temperature forecast, how to disentangle the climate change long-term signal, that is you know, a very hard topic. People sometimes do a you know, linear detrending and that's it, but it's far more complicated than that as, as we all know. So it becomes then like the time to deal with these other uh, factors, but even before climate, like setting the stage for understanding the different roles and that Mother Nature, Mother Nature actually cannot decompose those things as we humans would love to do in terms of orthogonal components, because the climate change is also impacting the natural climate variability one. Once they get there, and it takes a while, so then we can move forward into a few other specific tasks. I don't know if I'm ask, uh, answering your question, Paco. Yeah, it's, uh, you do. And actually, I agree with you that it's a really tough one. Um, and uh, at somehow it, it also links to some of the discussions we are having uh, concerning the preparation of some European proposals in which the, uh, the discussion turns around the use of climate forecasts as a tool for climate adaptation, not just for climate services. So we'll, we'll have more time to talk about this as well uh, in, the, in the next few days. Excellent. Okay, so... Um, I see that uh, nobody else uh, has expressed an interest in the uh, list of participants or the chat, so we can stop it here. Uh, thanks very much, Alberta and Gabi, for uh, uh, making this uh, possible in the physical world, uh, and uh, also to Angel for his very interesting talk and uh, the uh, answers to the questions. Thanks to the attendants uh, for um, the uh, uh for being present and uh, especially to education and training for uh keeping this cycle of uh, conferences alive so uh see you soon all of you and uh, i'll see you tomorrow Angel.